Coming up, she was the boss's daughter at Midwest Federal Savings and Loan and the first person indicted for fraud. But Susan Greenwood Olson says she has nothing to hide. I'm an innocent person and I have to believe in the system that, that it'll come out that way. That last twingy smarted a little. I hope this childbirth thing isn't painful. <laughs> Even though Julia Duffy's earned celebrity status over the past seven years for her role on Newhart, the Twin Cities native says she's anything but a Hollywood star. I don't live that kind of life. I don't go to those parties. My life, for the most part, is no different because I'm an actress than if I wasn't. This remote village in Yugoslavia is attracting people from all over the world because the Virgin Mary is said to be appearing here every day. One of those pilgrims is a Forest Lake woman who overcame a rare skin disease to see the miracles of Medjugorje. You know, Mary's graced that town, and I want to be with that in it and bring it back home. And finally, Kirby Puckett. He grew up in one of the roughest Chicago neighborhoods, but now he's the twins' $3 million man. And ever since I was a kid, I said, I want to be just like Willie Mays. All tonight on a Pout Mile special. Good evening, everyone, and thanks for joining us tonight. Last February, when Midwest Federal was declared insolvent, most of the media focused its attention on the savings and loan president, Hal Greenwood. But so far, only Hal's daughter Susan has been indicted in that case. She was arrested in March and charged with conspiracy, with seven counts of misapplication of bank funds, of making a false statement and submitting a false appraisal to the Federal Home Loan Bank Board. If convicted on all of these charges, Susan could face 47 years in prison. The day Susan was taken away, most of us knew very little about this woman and how she got herself into so much trouble. We wanted to find out. Susan and her family agreed to let us into their homes and to tell us. The day they knocked on Sue's door and put her in handcuffs and took her away, um, I don't think anything in life ever prepares you for that. They asked me if I wanted to put, get a sweater, and I thought, for what? I want to put over your handcuffs. And I said, no, if you're going to handcuff me, handcuff me. I mean, I, I don't have anything to be ashamed of. As she was driven away by FBI agents that day, Susan refused to cry, refused to hide the handcuffs. She was a Greenwood, and in spite of all that has happened, she says, still proud of her name. An old friend of mine always taught me to, whatever happens, you carry your head up high, and I do believe that there, there will be light at the end of the tunnel and there will be some good that will come out of it. Susan Greenwood was a happy child. She grew up in Minneapolis in a typical 1950s household. Her father, Hal, worked as an Edina policeman. Her mother, Carol, stayed home and raised the children. Susan and her three brothers and sisters were never spoiled by their parents, but they were introduced at a young age to a world of famous and powerful people. In 1965, Hal Greenwood succeeded his father as president of what was soon to become Midwest Federal. The savings and loan grew under his leadership. Hal became wealthy. How was it that Sue ended up going into the same business as you? Did she always have an interest in your line of work? Yes, she did. But she came through the ranks. She didn't come in, in any high office and didn't really have a high office when she left. My feeling is I, I guess I always portrayed myself as me, and I never tried to ride on the sure tails of my dad. And I was, I was very conscientious of, of making sure that that was almost the opposite. Did you know, Susan, that you were in trouble at the bank? No, absolutely not. Did you ever think you'd be indicted in the case? No. I still feel the reason, the main reason that I was let go is because I was Hal Greenwood's daughter and they didn't want to have anybody in the bank um, at any position that was connected to him. But um, it, it, it still is, is a, a big question in my mind as to why things happened the way they did. and and. Uh, particularly why I, was, why I was indicted, you know, by myself. One of the projects Susan worked on involved making loans to an exclusive Miami resort called the Jockey Club. She traveled to Florida to attend parties and receptions here, similar, she says, to political fundraisers. Susan claims this part of the job was frustrating and tedious. The government says she was living the high life. The parties down there were no more different than any typical, you could call, fundraiser reception. I mean, they were absolutely no big deal. 
the couple times that there were uh, affairs going on down there, they were to, you know, um, they, they were to promote the jockey club and to promote membership drive and so forth. And, and that was the entity of, of uh, um, trying to solve a, a very difficult situation. Was part of your job to go to parties and to entertain clients? No, I got very involved in the in the business aspect of of the jockey club and, and it was a type of situation where um, you know the people and the members down there um, you know were concerned that the bank um, wasn't doing enough or you know um, to um, you know keep a hands-on situation on the operation of the club and so um, Maybe they weren't doing enough at one point, and I got involved and ended up getting criticized for, for getting too involved in it. Do you ever think, Susan, about the possibility that you could go to jail? It's terrifying. Um, I know I can get through it. I, you know, I, I, what's difficult is, is having you know, two young kids having their mother taken away. Do the children know what's going on? They don't really know as far as... Um, you know, being indicted and charged, and, and I think they have an idea of, you know, there's some problems because of the stress level that I've had to go through in our whole family as well. You, you know, no matter what comes up in life with kids, you can't totally protect them. And, uh, um, but it, it's probably one of my biggest worries. Do you get to see your dad much? I mean, do you stay in touch with him? And do you still have a, a close relationship with your father? I think we're you know, a lot closer. He's had to be, you know, he's, he feels terrible as far as, you know, what I've had to go through. Well, it's, it's a, like a nightmare that you never thought would happen, and it did. And you, uh, you have to live through the dark of the storm until the light of day appears, and that's the only attitude you, I can take uh, you know, to handle a situation like that. Will life for the Greenwood family ever be the same after this? Oh, I don't think so. No. And I can't say that's going to be all bad either. You know, I do. I, I, we've had a chance to look at um, our priorities and uh, find out what we really value in life. Well, we virtually don't have any money left at all. You know, we'll try to keep our house if we can, um, but, uh, you know, if we have to live in a teepee and or whatever, you know, um, the personal belonging side of it is somewhat meaningless, you know, if we can keep the family together and, and um, uh, it's just going to be very difficult, I know that. Somebody asked me, and, and I'm going to ask you, because I was curious as well, why you agreed to allow us to do this story, which has not been an easy thing for you to do, I know. I wanted to at least get my either side of the story or explain to people that you know what you're reading in the papers is you know is this isn't me i'm an innocent person and i know that that uh, i'll be able to live with myself because um you know i'm telling the truth susan's trial begins july 9th in federal court in st paul still ahead new heart star julia duffy and twin center fielder kirby puckett This stage is where Julia Duffy, like so many other famous Minnesota actors, got her start. The Old Log Theater has nurtured the likes of Lonnie Anderson and Nick Nolte, both of whom went on to star in television and film. Julia got her first part here in a play called The Girl in the Freudian Slip. Now 20 years and six Emmy nominations later, she is a Hollywood star. She has the credits, the status, and more professional and financial security than she ever dreamed possible. But when we visited Julia in California on the New Heart set, we found one thing she doesn't have, a celebrity ego. In fact, one of the first things you notice about Julia is how natural, how Minnesotan she has remained. I forbid you to take the birth of our baby. Why? There is a slim chance I won't look beautiful when I'm in labor. But 
A lot of couples are doing it. So? A lot of couples go square dancing. That doesn't make it acceptable behavior. <laughs> Point For the well past taken. seven years, Julia Duffy has had what she describes as the perfect career. But playing the role of a rich girl working at a Vermont inn couldn't be farther from her own Minnesota background. Julia Hines, as she was known growing up in the Twin Cities, came from a no-frills Edina household. Her father died when Julia and her three sisters were quite young. Money was tight. Her mother struggled to make ends meet each month. And although Julia and her sisters weren't deprived, any outside activities that cost money were closely reviewed and carefully chosen. I wanted to take dance lessons desperately. And uh, my mother finally said we could afford it. And so I was trying to decide what kind of dance lessons to take and where I could take them. And, and just as I was deciding that, a neighbor told me that her daughter was going to take acting lessons because she was shy. And I, I just remember being struck by that thought and running back home to my mom and saying, I've got to take acting lessons. I've got to do that. She said, well, you can't take both. And I said, all right. So that's why I'm not an out-of-work dancer today. She was very focused. And of course, it was always that she was going to be an actress. There was never any question about it. Uh, there are not many people that you know in life at 10 who know what they're going to be. Julia began studying acting at McPhail Center for the Arts in Minneapolis and then launched her professional career at the Old Log Theater during high school. People talk about the thrills that you must have and the different things that have happened to her over the years and I still say the biggest thrill was the day that she called from the Old Log saying, I got the job. <laughs> Already experienced on stage, Julia still loved to participate in high school plays at what was then called St. Margaret's Academy. You know, sometimes a person's very talented, but they just want to be the star. She was very willing to be the supporting role or to be the lead. Uh, it didn't matter, just so that she had some type of part within the production. I think sometimes she was disappointed that she didn't think that I took her seriously in the sense that she was going to go off to New York and she was going to be an actress. After acting school, soap opera parts, and appearances on Broadway in New York, Julia headed to Hollywood and found her niche as part of the permanent cast of Newhart. Ow! <laughs> I think I felt another one of those twingies. Contractions, Stephanie. Don't you remember that word from Lamaze? Well, Michael and I didn't pay that much attention in class. We were too busy giggling at all the other mothers' god-awful maternity outfits. <laughs> I think that I'm able to play characters who are obnoxious and make you still like them. And I like that, too, because that's become the fun to me, the challenge. How, after playing a role for so long, like Stephanie, do you um, n not help but become a part of that personality? It's not the kind of heavy, dramatic role that you can't shake. I can shake Stephanie. I mean, she was my creation, and I created her as though she was nothing like me. And if she is, I, I don't want to know about it. <laughs> don't tell you. Right. You have been so successful, Julia, I mean, for many years. And yet, I got a letter from your mom. And she said, you know, nobody ever does anything on Julia, and she's from Minnesota. Well, first of all, there's a lot of celebrities from Minnesota. It's obviously a fertile place for people in the creative arts, so I'm just one of many, I think. But have you ever felt slighted by that lack of attention from your, your hometown? I've never felt it at all, but my family has. But I'm always telling my mother that none of this is very important, and uh, I'm sure I got it from her. She's, I couldn't imagine her putting career before family. And, you know, when you grow up with people feeling that way about family, it's, it's just the way you are when you have your own. It almost sounds as if you've had a mentor or somebody who's, who's helped you along the way sort of see the path to take and, and the attitude to keep. I never thought in terms of a mentor, but my husband probably has had a lot to do with it because he, for some reason, has always had this innate sense of uh, what is right and what is wrong. and how one should be in a relationship and how much one should give to a marriage. And I don't really know where he got this from, but he's so sure and so right about those things that uh, there was always this great reward. When I did put marriage and family first, or when I put him first, it was, it's always been so rewarding. Julia met her husband, Jerry Lacey, while they were both working on Love of Life in 1972. They have two children now, 
Carrie, who is four years old, and Danny, who at seven months still goes to work with his mother every day. Oh, he's mellow, isn't he? Mm -hmm. He is. Does he sleep through the night, Julia? If you call getting up at six in the morning sleeping mm -hmm. through the night. I do. I does. would call that sleeping through the night. I don't have to be away from them for very long at a time, which is nice. I couldn't stand that, and I've never had to do that. When I'm not rehearsing, I visit him, play with him, bring him on the set so the others can see him sometimes. It sounds like a pretty nice life. Yeah, I can squeeze in a little work in between playing with the kids. What, what if your children grow up and they say, Mom, I'm going off to New York at the age of 19 and I'm going to become a successful actor and actress? I'll say, why don't you just cut out my heart because <laughs> you're breaking it. Uh, we're the only people in the world, actors, who say, oh my God, you're following in my footsteps. This is horrible. Where did I go wrong? <laughs> Everybody else wants their kids to do what they do. You wouldn't want it for them? No. <laughs> why? Tell me why. Because it's this is very rare that you have this kind of luck. Most of the time you don't get to do what you want to do. And you will be rejected a lot and everything about you and how you look will be criticized. Uh, who wants that for their child? Now what did we learn in that baby class? That most of the other parents drive cheap domestic cars. <laughs> The television audience followed Julia through Danny's birth, which coincided almost to the day she gave birth to her make-believe Newhart baby. This was one of the most popular episodes in the program's eight-year run. Oh, my God! The miracle of birth! It was also one of the last. Newhart recorded its final show on April 13th, an emotional farewell for the cast and crew, and the end of a dream chapter of Julia Duffy's acting career. Yeah. <laughs> I, I really believe in my heart that I'll never do anything this good again. From all points of view, from loving the people that I work with, to the ease of the working situation, and loving the role. I've had a perfect life for seven years. Can you say goodbye? Julia is currently starring in a made-for-television movie with another name Minnesotans will recognize, former Viking Ed Marinero. Still ahead, the miracles of Medjugorje and American League batting champ, Kirby Puckett. When I was a small child attending catechism, I remember being fascinated by the story of Bernadette Subaru, a French peasant girl who claimed she saw the Virgin Mary at a grotto in Lourdes. After a four-year study, the Catholic Church ruled Bernadette's apparitions were authentic. And today, Lourdes is still known as a site of miraculous cures and healings. Now, over 100 years since Bernadette first reported her apparition, six young children in a remote Yugoslavian village claim they, too, see and talk to the Virgin Mary each day. The Vatican has formed a commission to study their apparitions, but in the meantime, millions of pilgrims already believe in the miracle of Medjugorje. One of those pilgrims is Cindy Speltz a Forest Lake woman who is suffering from a rare and incurable skin disease called Epidermalosa bullosa. It is painful, recurrent, and debilitating. Lord, I am not worthy to receive you, but only say the word and I shall be healed. Cindy attends Catholic Mass at this parish in Forest Lake every day. At 33 years old, her skin disease is just one struggle in a lifetime of heartache. People don't understand, you know, because I looked extremely healthy, but I have blisters on my feet all the time. We don't have the same chemical makeup as a normal person. The collagen um, in our skin doesn't connect your skin properly. So even like putting the wash from the washing machine into the dryer, I have to be careful because my skin starts rubbing and blistering and rubbing off. There's no cure. So I've lived with it all my life. Cindy's childhood in Memphis, Tennessee deteriorated after her mother's suicide. She was sent to an orphanage and separated from her six brothers and sisters. But as Cindy walked around the garden there, she came upon a statue of the Virgin Mary. And this place, this figure, became a touchstone for a very lonely little girl. When I would enter in this little garden, all my pain left. And I'd kind of talk to the statue, kind of for comfort. Cindy forged a deep and lifelong bond with the Mother of Christ a bond that continued to strengthen her faith through an unsuccessful family reunion, an abusive marriage, and a rare open-heart surgery for her first child. I finally was comfortable with being on my own, being single, having my faith, just being in love with God. Amen. 
Cindy's journey for peace became a dream come true this past Easter. A gift of $1,300 and the determination to overcome her physical disability made the miracle of travel to Medjugorje, Yugoslavia with her new husband, Tom, a reality. I don't, I don't want to go there for any cures or to ask for anything, just to be there, be among the people that, you know, Mary's graced that tone, and I want to be with it, in it. I know what it's going to be like. It's just like going to be home for me in my heart. Well, now, how are you going to make this trip to Medjugorje with this condition? Well, I have to look beyond my pain and just accepting, well, I was called. I feel I'm invited, and I'm going. We'll follow Cindy's journey when we come right back. These are the sights and sounds of early morning in this isolated southwestern Yugoslavian village called Medjugorje. Nestled between rugged brush and sometimes snow-covered mountains, the valley is checkered with vineyards and divided by a single main road. There are no hotels here, so for the past nine years this tiny community and its people have opened their homes and their hearts to religious pilgrims from all over the world. And it hasn't always been easy for them. The bishop of this parish, once a believer, now says the apparitions are a cruel hoax perpetrated by the local priests. And everywhere, gypsies are cashing in on the influx of the traveler's hard currency by setting up Virgin Mary souvenir shops. Foreign investors add to the monopoly by pouring money into local construction for restaurants and housing. Despite it all, the old way seems to survive this outburst of capitalism. And there remains here an almost eerie peace. A serenity Cindy and the rest of her 80 companions on the Queen of Peace tour out of Minneapolis are hoping to share. Uh, you see, at 11 o'clock, what they're going to do, they will have the old priest. This is the courtyard next to the church where the group gathers each morning for instruction and information. It is shadowed by two holy hills in the distance. Cross Mountain, where women of Medjugorje long ago erected a monumental stone symbol of their devotion to God. To the east, over the village, is Apparition Hill, revered as the site of Mary's first appearance to the children. Sister, we got to get your cab. Ivan's house now. Yes, they're going to go through the fields. Anticipation is high on this first day. It's a perfect day, isn't it? So beautiful. Cindy follows the crowd through the fields to the home of one visionary, Ivan. He is a young man with a shy presence who now suffers from near celebrity status because he continues to see the Virgin Mary each day. Before the apparition started, I wasn't a big believer. So that I could deserve this. And even today, I wonder, why me? Why was I chosen? As far as I'm concerned, I really would be so happy if everybody could see the Blessed Mother because it would be much easier for me. Uh, what does Ivan think of, of you, today's youth? And uh, is there any concern Mary has for today's youth? Our lady, she does worry a lot about uh, young people all over the world. Today, they really having difficulties and a lot of problems. He took about 15 minutes answering my question. And I know that Our Lady's working special with Yvonne about the youth and for the youth. Could I ask about Jacob Wetterling? He was kidnapped from St. Joseph, Minnesota in October, and he both has written to the family and everything. Could he possibly ask Our Lady anything about Jacob Wetterling? Uh, they are not allowed to ask right now to, to ask any concrete questions. They can only recommend and pray to Our Lady for, for the intention of that. Yes. What is the status I just of the learned about the depth of God's love, seeing how ordinary the visionaries are, how just they're so human and loving, and they're just living out the message each day as we should. Visiting with Ivan is just a beginning for Cindy. Made my day. What are we doing next? We're flying up the mountain. Yes, we're flying. <laughs>
Part of her personal goal during this week is to make two treks up the surrounding sacred mountains. On this day, she chooses Apparition Hill, a grueling 30-minute climb for already tender feet. You just go and I hang on you. You just go. Well, I did go up on Apparition Hill. To me, that's the place where Our Lady first appeared to the children. Uh, I wanted to be a part of that because she's been in my life for so long. I wanted to meet her. I wanted to visit with her. She's visited with me many times. So going as far as all the way to Medjugorje and climbing little Apparition Hill, well, it was a hardship. But at the same time, I, was, I felt a lot of grace in doing it. Oh, dear lady. Holy Mary, be our mother. Holy I was sitting there on the rocks, the jagged rocks, feeling the pounding of the pain of the blisters coming, and um, I knew we had to descend the hill. So I was kind of like getting up some courage to walk back down the hill, and there was Father Slavko. I went up and said hi to him, and he turned around to descend the mountain, and I stepped in his footstep, and uh, I had to look down on the ground to ensure that my foot was actually standing on the ground because I didn't feel my own weight. I don't, I don't even feel my weight. No, no weight, no weight on my feet. A personal victory and the first of many small miracles. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. In the valley, worshipers swarm the church continuously for mass, confession, and personal prayer. The priests speak to standing room only crowds in the native Croatian language twice a day, with French, Italian, German, Spanish, and English services in between. If I do not wash you, Jesus answered, you will have no share in my heritage. It was the ultimate experience for me. It's like I can't even describe the love I felt, and there are at least 30 to 40 priests that co celebrate the English Mass, and every word I just clung to, every word they said because I felt it. I just, it penetrated my soul. Outside, confessional lines are long and steady, representing a religious potpourri of nationalities. And even here in the courtyard, the simple wonders of Medjugorje appear. This is called the miracle of the sun, when onlookers can gaze into the brilliant rays without squinting or damaging their retina. Some say they see a shimmering disk in the sun's center, followed by a cross or a dove. Yeah, the more you watch it, the, the wilder it gets. It's spinning now. Can you see the red? Yeah, it's pretty wild. On Good Friday, Cross Mountain becomes the center of worship in Medjugorje. Thousands of believers stream up the hill to pay penance and remember the trial and crucifixion of Christ. Bronze statues representing the stations of the cross depict the Savior's life. Here, pilgrims stop, pause, and offer prayer along the path. It's an ascent more treacherous and twice as long as Apparition Hill. Cindy and her group chose to make the climb late that night because the Virgin Mary is expected to make an appearance there to visionary Yvonne. No, no stick. I might take it from you later right now. Fine, I don't, hopefully I don't need it. Oh boy. Well, they're coming already. Oh, I knew it. Oh well. The the climb. My blisters. Isn't as bad as it's Before I even left, I said in my heart I was going to make an attempt to go up the mountain. If I couldn't accomplish it, that as far as I went would have been good enough. Is it like this all the way up the high top of that mountain? I wanted to trust God to the point beyond my trust. Okay. I had to just give in to God and allow God to take me up the mountain if, if I had to because of my inability and my debilitation. Ouch. <laughs> well, there's, they're coming, but, you know, it's so appropriate on Good Friday walking a, a long terrain like this. But I did make it all the way to the top. Turn around and face the cross, Turn around please. and face the cross, please. 
No cameras and no flashlight. What happened was a lot of prayer and a lot of unity. Ivan came right behind, he needed to get by. Then he moved up on the steps to sit down. I sat right uh, two feet away from him, and uh, he began to pray, and everyone else did too. Blagoslovljen plod utrobe tvoje. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and the hour of our death. Amen. There was silence, and everyone was attentive, and uh, I felt uh, the peace of Mary, the peace of Mary. She greeted all of us to thanks be Jesus, my dear children. Then she prayed over us with her arms extended. After that, I recommended everyone in all their needs and attentions. Are you happy? <laughs> Did you feel her peace when she came? I knew, I, I knew her, of her peace when she was here. <laughs> The experience of Cross Mountain has become a painful morning after for Cindy. Her devotional climb further blistered her sensitive skin. Now, just walking is a major task. Okay, why don't you just follow me to church then? Just follow me. Today, the tour leaves the village to visit Father Yozo. He was the priest in Medjugorje when the apparitions first began. But he now serves in a church far away, sent here by the skeptical bishop to separate him from the visionaries. The distance, however, has not stopped Father Yozo from speaking out about the Virgin Mary's presence in his home parish. That message is the transformation of this world. Nothing less than that. Pilgrims are directly included in that transformation of the world with their love with their penance, sacrifices, and with their prayer. At dinner, food and conversation are plentiful. It's a time to share the events of each day. There is, there is a feeling coming through my body. Though Cindy won't attempt Cross Mountain again, many of her traveling companions are preparing to go before sunrise tomorrow morning. Is this everybody? It is 4 o'clock on Easter Sunday morning. I carried a rock to each station for each member of my family. Could you guys want to do that? Char will lead some of the young people up the path. It's a path she's taken several times before. In fact, the college student from Burnsville was so moved by her experiences in Medjugorje last year that she has visited three times since then and is now staying here for 10 weeks. I can't explain what it is about Medjugorje. It just keeps bringing me back here. And it's just, it's so nice to be in a society or a little village where everybody has God as the center of their life. That's the way it should be. And back in America, sorry to say, we're all too busy with everything. And we're all too busy worrying about what we're going to wear, where we're going to go to school. You know, I think that our priorities are really mixed up. Easter. My life has totally changed since Medjugorje. Realizing that you don't have to be some freak to have a prayer life or to have God in your life. So many people that come here that say that I'm not feeling anything. They come here, I think they're coming here more for the miracles than for what's really here. Oh, good. Look at the sun, you guys. <laughs> it is so beautiful today. Alleluia, amen. Alleluia, amen. At the church, Easter Mass overflows into the courtyard where congregants listen to the sermon and song over the loudspeaker and celebrate communion from roving priests. Are you hurting? Yeah, I have an extensive blistering, but oh, I've been coping better here than I have ever in my whole life. Especially the nearer I get to the church, I feel a little relief from the pressure of blisters. But uh, I managed to cope. This area around the church is truly the cornerstone for Cindy's deepening faith. Each day she has joined the numbers for mass and confession. Then later she prays the rosary until 20 minutes to 7. That's when Yvonne shuts the window in the church rectory to meet with the Blessed Mother. My 
opportunity to go to Medjugorje was one of thanksgiving and one of an enhancement of my faith in who I am and how I can be a part of my community here. And to me, Medjugorje is an example for the world. And whatever I uh, obtain there, I can bring home a piece of that and live it out. Stay with us. We'll be right back. In case you haven't noticed, twin center fielder Kirby Puckett is hot. Sure, he may have started off slowly, but the truth is when Kirby Puckett is involved, great things start to happen. If you ask him, Kirby will say, "Ah, oh, heck, I'm just one of the guys. But if you ask the guys, they'll tell you something different. They'll tell you Kirby Puckett is something special. He's a natural talent. There's no doubt about it. When he swings the bat, something good happens. Uh, absolutely no way you can not respect him. He's one of the five top hitters in the game today. He has speed. He has strength. He's special to the entire country, probably. Thank you. What makes him so incredible is that he finds a way to get a hit. Especially when you got guys in scoring position, you, you don't care for him to be up there. I mean, he's a guy who's going to hit over 220, 230 hits a year, and, 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 and that's amazing in itself. He's a Willie Mays caliber player. He's got a lot of uh, God-given ability, and he's using it to its fullest every day he comes out on the field. Without a doubt, he's probably one of the best hitters in the league. Really, I could sit here and go on and on about Kirby, but i uh, rather not do that because I know that he'll see this and he'll get the big head, so I'm going <laughs> to quit while I'm ahead. <laughs> What are you most proud of in your baseball career? The thing that I'm most proud of is just making it to the big leagues and being successful. That's all I ever wanted to do. I never imagined in a million years I'd make a million dollars. You know, I never imagined that I'd make a lot of money. Do you have like a first memory, an earliest memory of baseball? You know what, I'm, I was watching the Cubs game. My dad used to, it was a Sunday afternoon, and I don't know if I can remember back that far. I'm not going to sit here and say I did, but it was something about the baseball. I remember the Cubs were playing the Giants. And Willie Mays was with the Giants then. And uh, all, all, all the reporters, all Harry Carey kept saying was that Willie Mays, he's the best, bit, the best ball player in the world. and He's a complete, complete ball player. He can do it all. He can run, hit, throw, hit for power. He can do everything. And ever since I was a kid, I said, I want to be just like Willie Mays. I said, I know I'll probably never grow to be tall or anything. I'm going to be a little short guy as it is. But uh, there's no reason I can't achieve the same things he's achieved. I might not be able to hit as many home runs or... Uh, do the things the, the same way that he did them, but I can go about it the way that I know how and do the best I can. Where did you grow up in Chicago, Kirby? Uh, right on the south side of Chicago, right on the Robert Taylor Homes, 44th and State. Uh, one policeman noted it, noted it in the paper as a place where hope died. Uh, if you didn't know about the streets, then you didn't know. I mean, you had to learn about the, the, the pickpockets and the drug dealers and the purse snatchers. I mean, it was all these things, and they, all, you, all you had to do was just look around and just be observant and you'd see it. I mean, you wouldn't have to go out looking for it. I mean, it'll come looking for you. Were you ever, Kirby, as a young boy, um, tempted? No, I never. Uh, as a kid, I was, my mom always told me I was a good kid. I mean, I, I knew when I did something wrong and I knew I was going to get punished for it, but it was certain things that I knew were off limits. I mean, like drugs and everything in the neighborhood where I grew up, they were right there if you wanted them. I mean, they were right there in the open and you can have them. I mean, there was a lot of gangs and stuff, but all the kids in the neighborhood knew me. I didn't bother anybody. They knew that right after I got out of school and did my homework, they knew where I was going. I had my bat on my shoulder, put my glove on it, and I was going to play baseball. And I played uh, four years in high school and uh, had pretty good teams. But uh, where my high school was, I mean, scouts were afraid to come in there. I don't blame them one bit. And so I, I accepted the scholarship to Bradley University and went to Bradley University and played there for a year. And when I was at Bradley for three weeks, I was at Bradley for three weeks, and my dad passed away. I said, I've got to do something. Now, here I am, the baby, and that kid's thinking about, you know, I'm thinking about mom. I don't want anything to happen to mom. And I said, I got drafted in January by the Minnesota Twins. And I said, no, I just want to go to junior college closer to home and be closer to mom. And, and that worked out fine. I went to train junior college and ended up being junior college player of the year around the world. And my junior college coach was, he was super. I mean, he stressed fundamentals of the game, and, and I mean, he really checked up on you and made a man out of you. And if you, if you were doing something wrong, he'd tell you, hey, I know you didn't do this or do that. You know, let's tighten up. And, you know, some people in the world don't, get a, don't even get a chance. So I figured I wasn't going to mess it up. When Kirby was here, he was 
just one of the sweetest kids, and he was just Kirby Puckett, Nat professional, just Kirby Puckett, Triton, Triton baseball player, and he was so sweet. As you can tell, he's become our superstar and the nation's superstar. And this article appeared in our Chicago Sun-Times, and I was very proud and told Kirby, I says, one of these days, this article's going to have a lot of babies. And I've had to replace the board about three times we've had that many articles. And he's been a real, a real asset, and we're just so proud of him. Uh, the twins still have rights to me, so I signed with the twins for $20,000 and went on to Elizabeth in Tennessee to play rookie ball in uh, Visalia and played in Toledo, Ohio for the Toledo Mud Hens for three weeks and was in the big leagues in 1984. Yeah, that bag's empty. You can grab that Let's do it. We walk on the field, they should What a body. Still 365 days a year. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's been some great guys. I mean, the Minnesota Twins are always one of them teams. You never hear about controversy or anything. It's always, we're always laughing. We're always having fun regardless of what it is. Because it's so easy when, you, when you're down to just stay down. But... I think that's the challenge of it all, and when you're down a little bit, to just laugh and kind of pick yourself up a little bit and make you just push yourself that much harder. Kirby, as much as anybody, uh, more or less embodies the spirit of try to have a good time, play hard, enjoy it, do the best you can, and then tomorrow's another day, win or lose. I just go out and I just enjoy playing the game, Pat. I mean, I, trying to tell you, it's not many times that I really come home and I'm really upset. And, you know, regardless if I strike out three times or we lose or whatever, I might say to her, well, I should have took a couple of pictures or I should have did this or that, but if I could have, would have, should have. That doesn't do any good after it's all over, you know, it's over and that's it. And I just put a smile on my face and just come out the next day, next day because that's, one, that's the best thing about playing baseball is that it's 162 days of I'll get them tomorrow. And now you guys met, and Tanya tells me that you said to her the first time you met her, you were going to marry her? <laughs> the first night I saw her, I told her, I said, you're going to be my wife. I'm going to marry you. And you know how you women are. She goes, yeah, or, oh, yeah, no, nah, no, nah, just another crazy guy. Oh, man, not this again. So it was kind of funny. So I how mean, soon was it after that? We got engaged like two months later. Of course, I mean, I didn't love him, but he, and by the end of the night, he told me, he said, I am in love with you and I'm going to marry you. And I'm like, you know, you're really weird. <laughs> but I, to me, it was kind of funny. What's it like to be married to a baseball celebrity? I don't know any different, so I guess what you don't know, you, I mean, I don't know how I would compare not being married to somebody, you know, like Kirby. I mean, all I know is being married to someone who's, you know, considered a celebrity. I like to watch him play. You know, if he's not playing, I don't really find any interest in it. I travel with him a lot, and um, we laugh about it because, you know, we're the average wife. Might go on one or two trips a year. I mean, I go on like 10 or 12 trips a year. Really? Yeah, I really do because I, I married him to be with him. I know you wanted to have a family, and this is something you're working on. It hasn't been easy, right? No, it hasn't. I, I just knew uh, that whenever I wanted a baby, I'd be I have a baby, you know, but uh, uh, we'd be working on it and trying, but uh, it's going to happen. Would you ever consider adoption? Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, matter of fact, we've discussed it quite a bit, and uh, I think the next year probably. Do you want to have a lot of children? He told I me said, in the beginning 10. <laughs> I told her that when I first met her, I just, scared her. I just scared her a little bit. I told her that I always told my dad I was going to beat his record. You know, he had nine, so I figured I'd do 10, but that was just, that was a fib. <laughs> Tanya has told me this afternoon that she'll be glad when you decide to retire. I've had my first uh, security of my life as far as playing baseball, and I got a three-year contract, and I told her I'll play this three and uh, maybe get another three, or you know, maybe, maybe the twins are nice, they'll give me two more. <laughs> are you listening, <laughs> twins? <laughs> <laughs> but whatever, I mean, I got three now, and if I'm fortunate to continue to have success and get another three, I mean, that'll be six, and uh, I'll be 35 years old. Uh, there is more to life besides baseball. I mean, I'm only going to start to live after baseball is over. That's when my real life begins again. Number 34, the center fielder, Kirby Puckett. I know a lot of kids look up to me, and all I try to tell them is just, uh, I just try to just do the best I can. Just, just be Kirby. I'm not trying to be uh, somebody else. I'm just trying to be Kirby Puckett, who I am. I'm really, I'm just a team player. I like to do whatever it takes to win, because you know, I love to win. 
have a lot of women on this ball team. It doesn't matter if I hit the home run. I don't care if I hit the home run or her back or Gaetti or Gagne or whoever hits it, just as long as we win. That's the bottom line to it all. Hopefully I can play my whole career here in Minnesota because I love it. I love it. I hope, I hope I don't have to play anywhere else. Kirby is playing tonight at the Dome where the Twins are hosting the Yankees in the first of a two-game series. That's our show for tonight. I'd like to thank all of my guests and everyone who helped make this program possible. And thank you for joining us. I hope you'll join us again next time. Good night, everyone. Kvetu kreasti pektora, kvidiceris paraklitus, altissimi donum dei, fos vivus ignis caritas, et spirita visumcio. Tu septi formis monere, digitus paterne.